All right, guys. So we're going to get started with chapter 12 today. This is going to be antimicrobial treatment. Remember chapter 11? It taught us about controlling microbes, basically on surfaces, whether we go to autoclave things, instruments, stuff like that. Sterilization, everything. This is kind of the similar concept, but going on inside of your body. All right. Okay, so start with antimicrobial therapy, administering drugs to people to treat them. Now we call it chemotherapy. I wanna be clear about this. It is chemotherapy. Anytime you're treating somebody with a chemical, that's chemotherapy. So don't overthink that term. It doesn't mean cancer treatment. Um, <clears throat> we always wanna to try to pick a drug that's gonna kill the bad guy without harming the host. We're the host, by the way, the patient. So um, getting that accomplished, that's a tough, tough call, okay? Um, it's almost impossible to do because what happens when you're trying to kill like bacteria, for example, you kill the bad bacteria. You also sometimes kill the good ones in your body. So that can be a problem. Okay. What do you want in your ideal drug? You want to be toxic to the microbe, but not to the host. Microbicidal rather than static. We want to kill whatever that microbe is. We don't want to hang around for, you know, come back playing later on. We want it to be soluble in any body fluids. since That's where it's going. Um, we want to hang around long enough that it won't get broken down, say by your, or excreted through your kidneys or your liver or something like that. Um, we need to hang on long enough at least to kill the bad guys. Um, we want to be slow or non-existent development of resistance. So here we're just saying, we want the drug ideally to never, you know, your thing to be never resistant to it. I don't want to watch my face while I'm talking about this. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, other things. We want to complement or assist the activity of the host's defenses are normal. Like we talk about phagocytosis, right? If we can find a drug that could help that or, you know, aid in creating um, ideal antibody production, anything like that. So anything that remains active in the tissue and the body fluids, things that can get delivered to the site of infection. We'll elaborate on some of these later. And then we want to be sure they don't disrupt the host health by causing allergies or any other sort of side effects that could be negative to the host health. Um, including other side of like just negative side effects like uh, killing your biome, your regular biome. All right, some terms to be aware of. Prophylaxis. Prophylaxis is a term that we will refer to the pro being before and then ac the action basically. So we know a prophylaxis mostly, probably most commonly when we talk about um, dealing with sexual contact, right? Trying to prevent pregnancy. So prophylactics like condoms and uh, birth control pills. Those are we going to prevent? Same thing here. We're going to prevent infection by taking it ahead of time. So it's a prophylactic. Um, you might do this with somebody who's having a surgery coming up, especially if you're doing an implant of some sort, like a knee replacement. Um, you get them loaded up with antibiotics. And then uh, when it comes time to do the surgery, they're less likely to have those antibiotics survive because the antibiotics are already there. So bacteria won't be able to uh, survive that. Antimicrobial chemotherapy in general. That's a nice fancy term for drugs that kill microbes, right? Um, and antimicrobials, don't confuse antimicrobial and antibiotic, okay? Antimicrobials refers to any drug that will kill any microbe. That's a, that's a broad term. Whereas antibiotics now, antibiotics are going to be uh, drugs that are used to treat bacterial infections specifically, all right? So just now, uh, only bacteria for antibiotics. So you see B, think bacteria. We know some antibiotics will come from natural sources. This should be news to you if you know anything about penicillin. We know it came from mold, yeah? Uh, mold produced it to protect itself from the bacteria in its environment so it could have all the nutrients to itself. We have semi-synthetic drugs that we can make derived from the natural ones. We also have synthetic drugs. These are ones that we're going to completely engineer from scratch. Um, we have drugs that can be narrow spectrum. Maybe they only target, you know, uh, mycobacteria, for example. And then we have broad spectrum. Maybe they target all gram positives and all gram negatives, or maybe just like um, anything that doesn't have endospores. You know, those are big, big swaths of groups there. So normal situation for these, where they originally came from, Talking about things like penicillin here, fungi might make them or other bacteria might make them to stave off the growth of other invading bacteria, right? So we know that those would be selected for and have an advantage 
in evolution because if they can stave off things that are stealing from their nutrients, they're going to be more likely to survive and pass on those genes. All right, so back to those semi-synthetic drugs acting off of things like penicillin that we know the function and the structure of, maybe adding some side chains or something onto it to make it so now the bacteria are no longer resistant or it's gonna be more effective against gram negative. We've mentioned previously about the psyllins affecting cell walls. The cell walls um, are gonna be more important in the gram positives because they have those thick peptidoglycan cell walls, right? The gram negatives, they still have a cell wall, but because they have an outer membrane as well, they're gonna be less you know, affected by drugs that affect the cell wall, but they still can be, and they still can have a negative response to that when you kill them with these things, especially if we add on some other chemical groups that help aid in that. So now we're not just uh, only effective at gram positives, we're gonna also be more effective with gram negatives as well. That's what we prefer, right? So semi-synthetic drugs allow us to build off of the knowns that way. We also have the synthetic drugs, like I said, manufacturing them from scratch, from what you know about chemistry and how microbes work. The problem is the ones that are manufactured from scratch tend not to cross the membrane of the uh, targeted bacteria very well. So that's a problem. All right, you're trying to treat your patient. What should you start thinking about? You know, your patient is sick. Um, so you want to treat them with some sort of antimicrobial chemotherapy. You want to know the identity of the microorganism, at least preferably that it's a bacteria versus a fungi versus a virus, right? So we at least have somewhere to start with. Um, the degree of the susceptibility of that microbe to whatever drugs you may have available. If all you have are drugs that aren't really gonna treat the microbe at hand, you've got a problem, right? So you gotta know about that. Some microbes um, at face value, you might assume that they're not gonna be resistant, but what if you have a strain of that microbe that is resistant to whatever things you're trying to treat it with. So these are all things you want to know about. The overall medical condition of the patient is also important. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. First of all, you guys know well the Kirby-Bauer assay, right? We have our surface uh, of auger spread on the bacteria, put on our antibiotic discs, let it grow, and then look for the zones of inhibition. Zones of inhibition, the zones where growth was, at least we know, inhibited at the very least. Um, those clearings, right? And we can use those as a means to figure out how much drug we should be using to kill the bacteria. Um, we can use the profile of how your bacteria responds to certain drugs to form an antibiogram. So it's an antibiotic gram um, so that you can see your microbes sensitivity to whatever drugs you have available, okay? Um, so there, there it is. I know you guys are familiar with this image. If you aren't, then you got a problem. You haven't gone to the exam already. You got a problem. You're not ready for this one. Um, so this is our Kirby Bauer assay. We've got our little discs here. This guy's clearly not stopping anybody. Um, and then these ones that have clearings around them, right? We can't say definitively if we have killed or if we have inhibited, we just know that there's no growth in those spots, right? So, um, but either way, you can measure the effect of this antibiotic on this growth by measuring across a really terrible line, zone of inhibition um, by measuring the entire diameter, right? Not just the radius. So that's great. That gives you an idea of how effective that antibiotic is. There's another thing called the E-test or the E-strip. So this guy here, this strip has numbers on it and I, I, you can't really see it super clear on this, but top one is like 256. All the way down to the bottom, this is 0 0.016. This is talking about concentrations of the antibiotic within the strip. So as you go down the strip, you have less and less and less and less antibiotic. So somewhere around here, where that teardrop meets the strip, right? That is our minimum concentration that you need to be effective. Similar concept to what we have with the zone of inhibition, but we're not doing any calculating here. The strip is basically telling you um, from right straight value, right? So that's a pretty useful one. Um, so what, what is the whole point of that? We've talked about the minimum inhibitory concentration before. We're coming back to it because this chapter is a little more um, important than it was in the lab because we have to understand the theory now. So minimum inhibitory concentration is just the smallest amount of the drug that inhibits the growth of the bacteria, right? And we know that that happens at the edge of the ZOI. So that's where we can get that calculation from. Or the freaking E-test can just tell you straight up, right? 
Um, so this will tell you the smallest effective dosage of the drug. You can use that information to calculate that for your patient themselves. Um, it, sometimes it depends on the weight of the patient as well. So you might have to factor that in, but either way, it gives you a place to start figuring out how much of whatever drug you need to give your patient in order to effectively treat their disease. Um, there's usually an index that you can compare to. Some of them always have a zone of inhibition, no matter what, for all types. So it gives you a sense of, well, if it's a lot bigger than it usually is, then it's more effective for this treatment. So um, we have a machinery as well that can analyze this. I know we had you guys measure with rulers in the lab, but nowadays we can have machines that actually measure that and figure out the math for us in a clinical setting. So that minimum inhibitory concentration is going to give you some insight into your drug, how concentrated it is. And now you start uh, you know, administering it to your patient. But what happens if that drug is not successful, right? You give your patient the um, antibiotic and within uh, 24 hours, they're just getting worse. So what's going wrong? Maybe that drug is not able to diffuse into the compartment of the body where the infection is. If your patient, let's say, has uh, bacterial meningitis, and you can't get your drug across the blood-brain barrier, because some drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier, um, then you, you're going to be kind of screwed there, right? If that antibiotic that you chose doesn't cross. To give you guys a sense of the effect of the blood-brain barrier on drugs, how many of you, you know, show of hands, let's say, take uh, Benadryl and get drowsy from it? Yeah? Okay. Uh, how many of you, whenever you take Claritin or Zyrtec or um, Allegra, something like that, get similarly drowsy. Yeah, maybe a couple here or there, right? Those drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, Benadryl does. So that's where those drugs came from is they tried to find antihistamines that could work for antihistamines treating your allergies and not causing that drowsiness that you really feel as much with the other drugs. Um, with uh, like, you know, Benadryl proper, di diphenhydramine, right? So that gives you a sense of Drugs literally sometimes can't even cross that blood brain barrier. And we'll get more into the blood brain barrier when we get into the diseases later on, but especially the, the nervous system ones. But yeah. Okay. So you have to be able to get into the compartment. Another problem you might have if your patient has diabetes, um, a lot of times they don't have great blood flow to their extremities. I used to work, I'm sure I've told you guys this already a million times, but yeah, worked in Southwest Integris and we got a lot of appendages um, that were cut off of patients and brought up to us for pathology department. This is almost exclusively diabetics, right? They go and they stub their toe. They don't take very good care of themselves. So they let it go for too long and gets infected. And now because they have poor circulation, because they don't take care of their diabetes, their blood flow is so poor that it can't even get the amount of antibiotic to that area to treat it that they need. So we have to cut their limb off. There's no other choice. This person just let it go for too long. Otherwise you risk things like necrotizing fasciitis and gangrene and stuff like that. So you're saving them from that, but yeah. All right, so compartment of the body. That's actually a pretty important one to consider. Resistant microbes may not have been collected in your sample. Now we just had our you know, tubes of whatever and streaked them on our little plate. But what if you're swabbing from a wound and only a couple of bacteria have recently developed resistance, um, maybe just from random mutations, which can happen. And you just didn't pick them up when you swabbed the wound area. So um, now they're overgrowing because you treated with that antibiotic and now you've got a whole other problem on your hands. You could also have more than one pathogen and maybe you, one of them just overgrew in your Kirby Bauer assay on your um, mueller hitten auger, right? So that could be an issue as well. You didn't get to treat the other one. Okay, so with your minimum inhibitory concentration, that's the minimum amount that we need to inhibit the growth. What is, you know, if you're considering, what is the minimum amount that it takes to cause toxic side effects in humans as well? So um, if you can only take 20 milligrams of ampicillin before it causes some sort of negative side effect in people in general, but it takes 20 milligrams to kill your microbe, that's a problem, right? So you have to consider that as well. This may be something that can vary from patient to patient as well, just based on how much they in their state of health can handle from an antibiotic. So the ratio of 
the amount that's toxic versus the amount that takes to kill the microbe, the closer they are to one another, the more dangerous it is, yeah? So one to one is bad. So if you have a one ratio, bad. If you have outside of one, let's say 10, like it gives an example, that's a lot better. So the further we can get away from one, we want to shoot for, okay? So that's the therapeutic index. We also have maybe measuring the level of the drug in the person's uh, bloodstream, um, the range of that of blood level, whenever we're producing the desired level of uh, effect and not having toxicity. So that's the therapeutic window. Um, this also has a little bit to play with taking trough, troughs. If you guys have ever had uh, anybody, you know, get a blood sample from a patient who's receiving something like vancomycin or something that can be pretty um, stressful on the body to take, they'll often measure, um, take a blood sample at a trough, which means like they gave it to somebody and 12 hours later now, Specifically, we're going to take a sample and see what their level is for that um, drug. Or it could be not just the drug, but how their body is holding up 12 hours after receiving that dose. So that sort of stuff is very useful with treating with, with uh, drugs that can be pretty dangerous for your body and your uh, microbiome. All right. Think about your patient's history, their medical history. Um, any pre-existing medical conditions of any kind may come into play. Allergy to whatever the drug is, that's important, of course. Underlying liver and kidney disease, like we said, those are what are gonna process the drugs. If you've already got liver or kidney disease, they might be overstressed already as it is, and this could push them into having more health problems. Um, infants, elderly and pregnant women, as per usual with a lot of things, they're gonna be more sensitive to these scenarios. Uh, some of these drugs might be able to cross the placenta and they can cause birth defects. And that's something you want to be able to be considering if you're picking a drug to treat a pregnant woman. All right. Um, <clears throat> some drugs don't act well with one another. There are like, for example, if you are a woman, you may know that if you are taking birth control pills and you take certain antibiotics, those antibiotics can, you know, cause that birth control pills not to work. And they'll tell you that at the doctor's office. They should anyways, they're good doctors, right? Um, but that's something to consider as well. Can you avoid that problem with your patient, right? Um, and let alone the fact that some drugs are just going to make other ones not work altogether. Um, antimicrobials can affect your biome. We've said it before, but if you are killing off all of the good guys for your microbial antagonism, they normally take up the stadium seats. They normally are eating up the nutrients so the bad guys can't have them. You clear that area out, and now all the bad guys that um, were hanging out and wait, waiting can take over those spots, right? Things like C. diff, they're in small amounts, not a problem. Things like yeast, right? You take your antibiotic for your uh, UTI and now you've cleared out the whole biome and the yeast will overgrow. All righty, let's get into this concept of selective toxicity. This is one of the most important terms you're going to learn in this chapter and it will absolutely be on the unit three exam. Selective toxicity is something we've just been talking about this whole time, by the way. It just means that you want your drugs to kill or inhibit without damaging the host. That's, that term means that, okay? You want to work against the bad guys without damaging the host. Selective toxicity. Um, drugs that have excellent selective toxicity are going to target aspects of the bad guys, like bacteria, that you don't have in your body. Your cells and your actual body, I'm not talking about your biome, but your body itself, your cells don't have peptidoglycan cell walls, right? So things like the penicillins, they're great because they'll target those peptidoglycan cell walls and they'll not affect your cells at all, right? Um, but yeah, that's an example. So we mentioned when we talked about our control mechanisms that a lot of those chemicals are physical ways to control those microbes, affected cell walls, Jesus. Cell walls, nucleic acids, uh, proteins, or cell membranes, right? Those are the four that we talked about in control. Now we're adding on a fifth one, folic acid synthesis. Okay, so it's the same as the other one, add on folic acid. This is a great chart to refer back to, or even try to remake from your memory of your knowledge of the drugs that we're going to learn about and the ones that are on your study sheet. Um, you don't have to necessarily be able to point to what area of a cell drawing it's on, but if you can put them under those five categories, that's excellent. You wanna achieve that. That's absolutely the type of question I'm gonna ask on the test. 
more extensively than other types, I'm more likely to ask which of the following antibiotics uh, inhibits protein synthesis? Okay, so that's like the type of question I'm gonna ask. So be familiar with them at least on that level. Put them in their categories, know them that way, right? All right, 5% um, of people who take antimicrobial drugs in general will have serious adverse reactions. Maybe that's serious um, allergic reactions, but it could be tissues being damaged or even disruption of the biota to the point that it becomes um, affecting your health severely, like developing C. diff, right? That's a huge issue. You don't want to get that. It's a pretty serious disease, okay? Um, most of the time when you are being a drug that is toxic to people, you're going to affect the following organs. And I feel like it's all of them except for muscles, okay? So get ready. Liver, <laughs> liver and kidneys obviously are filtration and, and processing organs. Get a GI tract, cardiovascular, um, nervous system, respiratory tract, skin, bones, and teeth. These are the more likely organs that are going to be affected if you have toxic effects. Not all of them, of course, some affect other areas more than others, but right. so. so the drugs themselves, your body can see them as foreign and start attacking them as though they were antigens, which we learned about right with ELISA. So you start making antibodies against them. Um, then the next time you see them, those antibodies are just going to start attacking again and again and again. And that's how allergies work, right? And we'll talk about that. That's a whole other chapter, y'all. That's a whole other chapter. That's chapter 17. But um, that works the same way with these drugs, all right? So your body will react against it. This is more likely with penicillins and with sulfas, but mostly penicillins. Okay? They're more common than the sulfas. Um, so that's a problem because penicillins and the sulfas both target pathways that we do not have in our bodies at all, which would make them great drugs of choice to target things, but you're more likely to get allergic to them. So that's kind of a bummer, but all right. So we clear, so let's say you take your antibiotics for your urinary tract infection, and now you've cleared out your whole biome and the yeast that survive because they are not bacteria, right? They're fungi, um, will overgrow because there's nobody in the stadium seats anymore, right? So that's called super infection. The other example that I was giving that you guys know well, taking the antibiotics, clearing out the whole gut, clostridioides or clostridium, same difference, difficile, C. diff, has endospores. And so they'll survive the antibiotics typically and then overgrow when the stadium seats are clear because of those. And then that causes a severe colitis, inflammation in the colon, right? They call it pseudomembranous colitis because you have development of membranes um, within the colon. That shouldn't be there. The block, block the colon. All right. So that's the badness of them. So let's get into talking about how they work and the goodness of them, right? This is a chart showing um, the spectrum of activity, how widely used some of these are. You'll notice that there's a whole section just for mycobacteria like tuberculosis, right? There are acid fast positive guys. Um, this one, this one, and this one almost exclusively used. I'll say this for polymyxin, it's going to come up later. It doesn't just get used here. It gets used in another place as well. That's going to be kind of important. But my point is those are pretty limited. Those are pretty, um, you know, narrow range treatment drugs, whereas you can look at freaking tetracyclines, man. That's across the freaking board pretty much. So um, some of them are pretty broad ranges. So why don't we just treat everything with tetracyclines? Tetracyclines are pretty toxic. So that's why. We'll move on to how these things work so we can get a better understanding of them. All right, this is uh, your first group, all right? This is the cell wall affecting drugs. So cell wall. The first within the lineup are going to be the psyllins, okay? The penicillins. They have this special structure in their makeup, their chemical makeup called a beta-lactam ring. They're not the only ones that have this, but the psyllins and everything derived from penicillin, you know, that's, they're all related. They have the beta-lactam ring. Definitely know what a beta-lactam ring is, that it applies to the cell wall, um, preventing cell wall synthesis, okay? That's how they are gonna work. Penicillins, they've got beta-lactam ring, drugs with that affect the cell wall, all right? Next, still in the cell wall, We've got the penicillins, the second one, cephalosporins. They also have a beta-lactam ring, and that's pretty much all I'm going to say about them. Okay? They work similar to, to the penicillins, but they don't end in psyllin. 
that's the difference here. <laughs> Cephalosporins. Third, a pretty important one in medicine is carbapenems. Carbapenems also affect the cell while they don't have a beta lactam ring. They are the last line of defense antibiotic. If you haven't heard of it, good, you're lucky. Don't, is how I would say, right? You don't want your patient to ever wind up on carbapenem. They're pretty serious. There's a reason we keep it for last line of defense. You think MRSA is bad? Wait till we get to the guys that can withstand carbapenem. That's the real concerns, okay? All right, so um, these are the last line of defense. We also have, I put a four down here. Don't count these guys out, all right? Bacitracin, this is in Neosporin. Neosporin has three antibiotics and a triple antibiotic cream. You guys know that. Um, the three antibiotics are going to be bacitracin. We already mentioned uh, polymyxin, right? And then um, neomycin. That's why we get neosporin. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what each of them are, just kind of in passing. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but right now, bacitracin affects the cell wall. Okay, we have isoniazid. I'm probably not ever going to ask about it. That treats tuberculosis, affects the cell wall. And vancomycin, okay? I want you to know something about vancomycin. It ends in mycin. I'm gonna come back to that later. Uh, but vancomycin, cell wall, okay? We have the beta lactams, the psyllins and the cephalosporins fall into that. The carbapenem, our last line of defense drug. And we have these random guys were thrown in there, um, like bacitracin and vancomycin, all right? Cool, that's it for the cell wall. This talks a little bit more about how they work if you're interested. All righty, um, <laughs> moving on to protein synthesis. That's it for cell wall protein synthesis time. Um, you know how we had just mentioned in the cell wall, how we had this whole group that fell into like beta lactams, right? Um, that included the psyllins and the cephalosporins. Here we have amino glycosides, okay? This is a group that falls under protein synthesis inhibitors. Um, all of those drugs that, you know, apply to this. They came from these places that I'm never going to ask you about, uh, but a lot of them, importantly, end in mycin, y'all. What did we just introduce that ended in a mycin? Vancomycin, right? It does not fall into this category. That's why I'm bringing it up specially and bringing special attention to it. So hopefully you remember that vancomycin does not belong in this category, but all the other mycins do, as far as you're concerned, all right? Uh, such as streptomycin. Here's the structure of it. I don't really care that much that you understand it, but there it is. So here's how these guys work. I'm not going to talk about these because I can't even say this word. If you want to hear me try to pronounce this word, here it goes. Oxazolidinones. I don't know, but there it is. I don't know what they are. Don't need to know them because I can't pronounce it. Um, another one I don't know much about is the uh, pleuromutilins. I don't know much about those. I'm not going to ask you about them. So once you do want to know about or the protein synthesis, the amino glycosides in general, like I said, most of the mycins are going to be under here, like streptomycin. These guys are gonna cause um, misreading of mRNA. Cool, that's how they work. Tetracycline and glycyl cyclins. That took me a long time to be able to say that one, by the way. Um, tetracycline and glycyl cyclins. These guys uh, are going to block tRNA. So remember, those are going to bring in our ribosomes, matching up those codons and anticodons. Um, amino acids will get matched up as a result. So then we have uh, down here erythromycin. And this is going to prevent the ribosome from moving down the mRNA. So that's called translocation. So it prevents that. So I'm not going to ask you about those, but I feel like so that you understand how these work, they affect the ability of translation to occur, right? Remember translation, going from the mRNA to the protein. They affect that, and I want you to just get that kind of out of this, okay? I'm not going to ask you about the specifics of each one. You know, they affect translation, and you're doing all right. There's another example that falls into the category. We talked about tetracyclines and glycylcyclines. Tetracyclines, also going to be derived from uh, streptomyces, uh, but a different drug, okay? Um, that's all you really need. I don't know. They're tetracyclines. <laughs> Tetracycline can cause pretty serious um, side effects. And one of them that's like permanent is if you take tetracyclines for a while, you get these gray lines on your teeth. And I mean, they're prominent gray lines and they're there forever. 
you can't get rid of them. The whitening is going to get rid of them. You'll have to get veneers in order to cover them. So it's pretty significant if you on those for long periods of time. Um, so whatever. Macrolides is another group that can fall under this that I, I'm, again, not going to ask you about these, but the reason I'm bringing them up is just because they are related to structure of antibiotics and antimicrobials in general. So cool. There it is. It's a thing. A lot of the mycins, again, look at that. Mycin, 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 protein synthesis, except for Vanco, right? That's kind of the point there. All right. That's it for the protein synthesis. We said the aminoglycosides. We said the um, mycins. That's protein synthesis, pretty much, and the tetracycline, glycocycline. All right, folic acid synthesis, the pathway that we do not have in our body. Um, anybody in here ever, not necessarily asking if you've been pregnant, but know about that you have to take folate when you're pregnant. You know about that? Right. We don't make folate in our body. You have to have it supplemented in your diet. And when you're growing a baby, you need more of it than you usually would. Bacteria make their own folate. Folic acid, folate, you know, we've talked about pyruvate, pyruvic acid, that sort of stuff. Same thing, all right? So they can't uh, do that. Um, they make their own. They don't need it in their diet. So our cells aren't going to be affected by drugs that affect this. That's great. These are the sulfas. I would remember if you see something with sulf in it, like sulfur, right? And we know sulfur is stinky. Let's just agree on that one, right? Um, another thing that is sticky, stinky is methane. Okay, so I'm bringing this up because if you see a drug that has sulf or meth, like trimethoprim, I want you to think stinky, the stinkies fall into folic acid synthesis prevention. All right, that's how you can remember that. Sulf, uh, uh, sulf silver sulfadiazine, trimethoprim comes along with sulfamethoxazole in a form that you guys are probably more familiar with as Bactrim. I don't know how to spell it correctly ever. I think it's like this, back to rim, but I don't know if that's right. Uh, but you just heard of it probably, yes. So this is basically what that is. Stops folic acid synthesis. How does this work? It is competitive inhibition. This is the, the best, right? So you guys definitely remember this stuff, competitive. I definitely can read that. Okay, so competitive inhibition. And um, what that means is that our uh, drug is basically going to sit in the active site of the enzymes involved in making folic acid. There's a few that are in several steps along the way. Um, any of them that affect this tend to fall into this category though, okay? So they're gonna bind at the active site. That means it's competitive inhibition. So now the normal thing that it's going to act on to make folic acid along the way, it can't act on that. The whole process is shut down and uh, cut short. So that's how those work, competitive inhibition. That's it for our, those. Is that a vacuum cleaner or is that tornado siren? Okay, <laughs> I feel like I have to ask the question. <laughs> All right, um, not that it would ever take out this building, right? Right. I feel like we'd be very really safe anywhere in this building. So, and the bacterial drugs that target nucleic acids, DNA or RNA, right? These are fluoroquinolones. These guys, just a group, like we had the, glimine, the amino glycosides for the proteins, right? We had the beta lactams for the cell wall ones. So the fluoroquinolones, nucleic acid ones. All right, they're pretty serious. We've got nucleic acids. This is a problem, so if we inhibit replication or transcription, one of those things that involve nucleic acids, that can affect us potentially as well. So we're talking about side effects like seizures and brain disturbances, pretty serious stuff, right? All right. <clears throat> um, this is going to include, luckily, our fluoroquinolones. What I need you to remember about them, they're going to end in floxacin. You guys already met one of these, right, in lab? Ciprofloxacin, so that's Cipro. I'll put Cipro over here, but it's down there anyways. So anything, floxacin, just shove it under uh, fluoroquinolone. So if I ask you what are drugs, which of the following include drugs that are gonna inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, then if I put fluoroquinolones, you better be able to recognize that. 
But if I put anything fluoxacin, you better be able to recognize that. And if I ask which of the following are fluoroquinolones, fluoxacins. Think about it that way, all right? Cool. There's also rifampin, which I, is not on your list, by the way, but it falls into this category. All right, that's it for the nucleic acids. That one was pretty easy, yeah? The fluoxacins, the fluoroquinolones, that's all you need to know. <laughs> All right, cell membranes. The only one I'm gonna ask you about is polymyxins because we talked about uh, bacitracin affecting the cell wall, right? We talked about, uh, we didn't bring it up specifically, but neomycin, the mycins tend to affect the protein synthesis, right? And then now we have a polymyxin. These guys affect the cell membranes. So those are the three in the triple antibiotic. Okay, That's why I bring this one up. Otherwise, I don't really care too much about the cell membrane guys. Daptomycin is useful for treating leprosy. I mean, I don't know how much you guys are planning on coming into contact with that. They also use it for um, acne treatment as well, though, just FYI. And it is also very good, daptomycin, for uh, treating biofilms and inhibiting biofilm formation. So it's good for that. But I'm going to ask you, if I ask you about any cell membrane drugs, polymyxins. Okay. We're already cutting it down pretty nice. So here's our biofilm one, Dr. Dacomycin, pre-treat. It's like uh, great for that. All right. That's it for the antibiotics. We make through the antibiotics, y'all. That's the biggest group. Yeah. <laughs> Next, we're going to go on to the fungal infections. We've still got some key ways to remember these guys too, so don't worry, all right? Because we are treating fungi now, they are eukaryotic cells, just like your cells are eukaryotic cells. So um, you've got to take that into consideration. We can't just target, you know, the cell wall that you don't have and stuff like this. So it can become more toxic for people. Some big ones, the ones I want you to remember, there's only basically two categories. Um, amphotericin B. It is a macrolide, which we mentioned earlier. I won't test you on that, but just bringing it up again. Amphotericin B is a pretty big one. It's considered kind of like a, a next level antifungal. If the other ones didn't work, then they'll come in with the amphotericin B. You guys remember how I told you how I had that fungal sinus infection? Well, the drugs that I had to go to for the compounding pharmacy and have it made special was amphotericin B suspension. I had to shake it up and keep it in the fridge and like squirt it up my nose and all of this because the other ones that they normally use to treat it didn't work. So just so happens, so that's amphotericin B, just so happens the other ones that didn't happen to work for me were azoles. This is going to include ketoconazole, fluconazole, myconazole, and um, clotrimazole. So anything ending in an azole. Um, I don't really know what else to say about this. They're gonna use these to treat fungal infections. Most of these you've probably heard of, Ketoconazole is pretty widely used to treat a lot of different kinds of fungal infections. If you go to uh, Walgreens and you want to treat your athlete's foot or you want to treat your um, yeast infection over the counter, myconazole is what you would be reaching for there. So it's an antifungal. You can just get it over the counter. These drugs like fluconazole, pretty useful in treating uh, more serious fungal infections like fungal meningitis, which is like cryptococcus meningitis, as it says down here. Um, but if they, that doesn't work, they'll reach for the amphotericin B. Okay. Um, that's it. So we know amphotericin and azoles for fungal infections. Yes. There is a caveat here. So I said the mycins had the caveat of vancomycin. Vancomycin treats cell walls, right? But it was the only one, everything else, proteins. There's one azole that migrated out of this group and treats protozoa. And we'll come back to it soon. I'll tell you what it is, but it's the only one. So at least, hey, it's just the only one again. So we'll worry about it. And I'll tell you how I remember it soon. All right, starting off with some of our protozoal and anti-helminthic medications. Um, start with malaria. Historically, we treated malaria with something called quinine. I don't know how, how many of you have heard of quinine, they came from like the bark of a tree and they started using it like chew on the bark and stuff like that to help treat or prevent malaria. Um, I mean, I'm talking like a long, long, long history of this. Even um, you guys know the story of how like Britain was trying to, to occupy India for a very long time and other places of the world too. Let's not stop them there. Right. But 
for a long time, they were trying to take over India and they were moving to India and trying to live in this place that had um, malaria endemic there. So they had to devise ways to treat their um, malaria or prevent getting from malaria. One of the ways was through quinine. And they didn't like how the quinine was tasted. They didn't want to treat, you know, chew on the tree bark or whatever else people were doing. So what they did was they made this sort of um, liquid that they could drink from the quinine. And it was like a fizzy water. Um, like you would think of like seltzer and it had this quinine in it, but it had a bitter taste to it. And people didn't really want to drink it. So they found a cheap way to get people more interested in drinking this tonic water. And that, uh, that's gin, okay? <laughs> so they used juniper berries and made some cheap alcohol and people were more than fond of drinking their gin and tonics, which is exactly what they were making. Tonic water has quinine in it. It's seltzer water with quinine in it. Nowadays, I think it still might have quinine. I'm not hundred percent sure. I think it doesn't like trace amounts though. It's like out of like, yeah, it's like out of like, you know, a nod to it or whatever, but it doesn't have the amounts that they had back then. Quinine is pretty toxic. If you have too much quinine, uh, it'll make you go blind. So people really were loving their gin and tonics and some of them were going blind because they were drinking so much of their gin and tonics, they're getting too much of their tonic. Um, and it became a problem. Nowadays, we work with uh, derivatives of quinine that are still effective. Things like chloroquine and uh, primaquine, and there are other versions, they all end in like quin, like quine, like the quinine, right? Um, they treat plasmodium species, but certain plasmodiums, we've got plasmodium falciparum, we've got plasmodium vivax, we've got plasmodium malariae, and there's other ones too. Not all of them are treated by all of them. So maybe one of them treats one kind and the other treats another kind. So it's kind of tricky. You have to figure out what strain of plasmodium and treat it as such. We also got this other thing that I'm never going to ask you about, but it's called our Artemis, I don't even know, but that thing, artemisinin, I don't even know what that is, but um, they'll treat malaria too, if the other stuff isn't working for you. Like I said, I'm not going to ask you about it. I want you to know about the quinine and its other drugs that came from it. Yes. I think it just has to do with how the preparation is made of the drug. So I think, um, like how you guys have noticed, I'm sure, when you go take your medications, a lot of them might be like um, diphenhydramine hydrochloride, right? So that hydrochloride at the end, it's hydrochloric acid, but it's compounded with the diphenhydramine to make it uh, more soluble in body tissues and stuff like that. So it probably has something to do with that. I don't know enough about it, but that's usually what it is. That's a really good question though. Um, I think this is stuff that you guys will learn about if you guys, for those of you going into nursing school when you get into pharmaceutical training, but, um, Anyways, let me know if you do find out about it. Next, the uh, so we have malaria, that's a protozoa. The other, the other protozoas, how are we gonna deal with those? This is the azole I was talking to you guys about, all right? This is the one that migrated away from the fungi. This is metronidazole, it is an amoebicide, okay? So we've got our amoebicide and we've got our anti-malarials. Our amoebicide is metronidazole. It's got this azole group and the way I look at it is, um, I feel like the protozoa are more advanced than the fungi. In my mind, they are anyways, when you're like really stepping up in advancement of these, um, you know, pathogens. So we've, you know, sort of graduated from the azoles with the fungi up into the big city, the metro. That's how I remember it. So big city, the metro, metronidazole, we're treating the big, the big kahunas now, the protozoas, stepped up out of the other guys. Uh, metronidazole, also very useful in treating anaerobic infections. So bacteria, things like C. diff, don't like that. Um, so strict anaerobes can be treated with this as well. Uh, for the helminths, now we're talking about worms. Um, the worm infections, you guys know that. We have these two up here that I'm never gonna ask you about. Albendazole, again, another zole that I don't need to worry about it. Uh, pyrantel, don't need to worry about it, okay? What's on your list? Proziquantel and ivermectin. These are widely used anti-helminthic drugs, especially in veterinary medicine, but also in people, okay? Um, like our pups, my husband and I, with that we adopted, they had heartworm whenever we adopted them and they're being treated they're on their third week. They're just finishing their third week now of um, post initial treatment, which is the hardest, kills the adults. And the little bits of the dead adults 
are going to break off and they can get stuck in their bloodstream and cause um, blockages like causing strokes would do, right? It's pretty dangerous. They aren't allowed out of their little kennels. They've been in their kennels for three weeks, you guys, these little energetic doggies stuck in their kennels for three weeks. We only let them out to go to the bathroom. Um, so we can't wait, but they are due after their fourth week to get another shot of ivermectin. So this is actively used to treat um, helminth dick infections that exist in the United States today. So, all right, moving on to the antiviral agents. Uh, the three most common ways that most antivirals are gonna work. We're either going to block the virus from getting in to the cell, block it from building its parts or prevent it from maturing. So that's like if it's budding out, like clipping its little body off or whatever it is that it needs to do to form its little viral particles, okay? So those are the three ways we can target them. The problem with viruses, as I'm sure you can imagine, is they use our machinery to replicate. They use our cell parts and everything in our cells to replicate. So drugs that target viruses tend to be very specific. Not always, but they tend to be, okay? You get so many freaking HIV drugs out there, you guys. So we're gonna go through some of these. Um, I'm gonna tell you the ones that you need to worry about, right? So we'll start off mentioning some of the HIV stuff. Um, here's Enfuvirtide, which is very commonly used. Um, Anti-HIV medication has been around for a while. Blocks um, the fusing of the virus with the cell so it can't get in properly. I'm not gonna ask you about it though. What am I gonna ask you about? Things like Zanamivir and um, amantadine, which we know more commonly as Relenza and Oseltamivir, which you guys know as Tamiflu. They work the same though. And I would ask you about Relenza or Tamiflu. I'm not gonna ask you about the other names of them, but I do wanna point something out about the antivirals guys. They all have vir in them, V-I-R. That should be a dead giveaway if I give you choices, okay? Um, so that's easy. But so Relenza and Tamiflu, here's a thing to know about influenza, okay? You know H1N1 or H5N1 or whatever. The H, it stands for hemagglutinin. Later on, we'll talk about what that means. The N stands for neuraminidase. Neuraminidase is an ACE enzyme, right? Neuraminidase is an enzyme that will help the virus get into your cells by cleaving off some surface molecules. It will help by breaking down mucus. And this third function helps by clipping off molecules when it is budding out of your cells. So if we can target that, we can stop flu from spreading in your body. The problem comes from you have to take more Tamiflu if you're later in your infection because you have to block all those molecules of neuraminidase. So if you catch the uh, infection early on, you can take safe levels of Tamiflu. Um, if you wait too long, you just can't get enough to really control it effectively. So that's why they really push, if you guys have flu or if you have a kid that has flu or something like that, try to get them in as soon as possible because it's gonna be more effective earlier on in the infection, right? It's like trying to plug a whole bunch of holes. It's only so many hands, right? Okay, so that's neuraminidase and uh, the flu. So these are other ones. This next one, remdesivir, which I don't know a whole lot about, but I know that it's used to treat COVID. There you go. Um, and then ribavirin is a pretty commonly used um, antiviral medication. We use it for hepatitis C and some other diseases as well. So um, ribavirin can be used widely as can um, there are other, other antivirals as well that I included like Valtrex um, is an example. We know that we treat uh, herpes with that, but it can be used for other viruses as well. Um, anyways, um, when we're talking about uh, hepatitis C, I don't know if you guys know about this. Hepatitis C, we know it's pretty severe. It can lead to liver cancer and all this, but it can be cured, completely cured. We don't have a vaccine for it. That's transmitted by, you know, needle use, right? To bleach your needles, of course. Um, but it can be cured using ribavirin. And there's other drugs they'll include with that treatment as well. Um, hepatitis B also can cause um, liver cancer. It's actually more widely associated with liver cancer than C is but um, it it's, doesn't have any treatment. If you get it, then you're screwed, but there's a vaccine for that one. So be prepared, right? So that's what we say, you're supposed to have your Hep A and Hep B vaccines before you go work in a healthcare setting and stuff like that. Um, hep B, also neat, a neat little fact about it, 
it has reverse transcriptase. I know we've talked about HIV, you know, it has its RNA genome. It uses reverse transcriptase to make DNA and inserts it into your DNA. Isn't that fancy? Hep B is a DNA virus. And I don't know why. And don't ask me why. I have no idea why it evolved this way, but it did. DNA virus, it makes its RNA just like we do to make its protein, you know, mRNA, that sort of thing. But it uses that RNA to make DNA using reverse transcriptase and then inserts that into your genome. And that's where the cancer would come from. So there you go. Fun, fun fact about, you know, hepatitis, I guess. All right, moving on to uh, more of the HIV drugs. That's pretty much what I'm going to say. There they are. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of them. HIV has a lot of things that they want to target because we've said that um, it hides out in your genes. It's just hard to get it out. So they try to target the virus wherever they can to, you know, neutralize as much of the virus when it is out as possible. So there's a lot of them out there. HIV has reverse transcriptase we can target. We've mentioned that. It also has something called protease like it talks about here. It makes its proteins in one long string and then clips them using protease. If we can block that, they can't build the virus particles, right? So remember the capsids that they need. Um, and then the other one is integrase, which is the one that it uses to insert its DNA copy into your DNA. So if we can target those, they're great targets. They don't affect our um, biome or anything at all. All right. Drug resistance. So we've talked about everything, all of the treatments of all of these different um, kinds of microbes, right? Moving on to drug resistance, because it's a problem. It's a thing that we have to deal with, unfortunately, quite a lot more than we would like to. Whenever microbes can tolerate the drug that they shouldn't be able to tolerate, that's resistance. Go figure. Um, it can be intrinsic or acquired. We have intrinsic, meaning that if you are a bacteria that produces the antibiotic, like, like erythromycin, you produce that naturally, you have to be resistant to it, right? That's just part of the rule that you play, okay? Uh, acquired means that you normally would not have resistance to this, but you have somehow gotten resistance outside of this. You don't make this antibiotic, um, but you're being exposed to it now and somehow are resistant to it, okay? That's what we're talking about. Intrinsic just means you are uh, resistant to your own antibiotic that you make. All right. How do we become resistant? We can get resistant through spontaneous mutation. Now, it's not very common to have mutations that are advantageous at all in any way. Very, very, very uncommon. Um, it's less common to have it affect, you know, drug resistance specifically. So why does it happen spontaneously? Well, we know how quickly microbes can multiply. So it really doesn't take very much multiplication of those guys to get an effective mutation working for them. We talked about the E. coli and how you played it with no antibiotic and then increase the antibiotic. And over time, eventually, they will all evolve to be able to cover the entire plate, like within a week. Um, we're talking about basic E. coli, like you might have in a lab. So um, they can do it. It doesn't take a whole lot. All right. If you have uh, acquired some sort of gene from somebody else that allows you to be resistant, we call that a resistant factor. A lot of times this is going to be a plasmid. Just like the plasmid we learned about, but it won't have been engineered. It's just naturally occurring plasmid, right? So resistance factors are usually plasmids transferred through conjugation. Remember, that's going to be through the sex pilus. They're going to transfer um, that you know, copy of the plasma to the next cell. We have transformation, which you guys have to know for lab, right? Um, that's going to be picking up exogenous DNA, competent cells that pick up exogenous DNA. And then we have transduction. This is going to be uh, bacteriophages coming along, infecting the virus, infecting the uh, host bacteria, and then implanting its little DNA into the host genome, and it gives them new genes, right? Lysogeny. Um, lysogenic conversion, those are the terms related to that. So, um, and then there's other thing that I'm never going to talk about, which is transposons. I don't like it. So, uh, but the other three, we have to know. Um, and then it can be transferred within the species. So, we got our three different ways of horizontal gene transfer to transfer our R factors for resistance. Great. So, what do they do for us? What do the genes encode? What exactly is it doing when I say that it has ampicillin resistance on the plasmid? What is it coding for? Okay, we have enzymes that they can make that can actually inactivate the drug, like chew it up basically so it doesn't work. You could do that. 
you could have uh, less uptake. I want to say this decreased uptake that. Um, so you might even change the receptors for the molecule on your cell to change the shape of them through a mutation. So it doesn't let that molecule in anymore. It usually uses this, um, you know, lock to get into, um, but the key hasn't changed. The drug key can't get into the lock anymore if we change it with a mutation. Okay. It's the same concept with this as what we see with the viruses. Um, but now we've mutated it and it doesn't work anymore. But, so we can also eliminate the drug immediately. What do I mean? Now we make this weird channel and just shoot out the drug when it gets inside, which is weird to think about, but like that's a thing they can do. So penicillin just comes into the cell and we just shoot it right back out. You forget it. You're not gonna work here today. Next we have binding sites reduced. We had a change in the binding sites what we just talked about, right? The change in the lock. But now we're having a reduced number of locks, maybe even altogether. So now the drug can't get in enough to be effective. Um, and then we have uh, changing of metabolic pathways. We had the decreased affinity side um, and the metabolic pathways. So like the folic acid synthesis. So what if we changed uh, our intermediate that we need? We can completely change this freaking chemical pathway that we normally go down. Mutations can allow us to do that by changing the you know, enzymes we're using and therefore the things that they're gonna act on. So cool, so that's the ways that they can work. How, uh, how's it gonna work? You only need, let's say we're talking about just a normal mutation or even one cell got introduced that has an R factor, right? All it takes is one. If I were to kill off all of these other guys in gray with that antibiotic, now they're all dead, the red ones are left and now they're gonna overgrow, right? And even the ones, the gray ones that may get reintroduced or may have survived, we can transfer that R factor back to them and make them resistant too. So that's how antibiotic resistance gets spread basically and how our actions actually can aid in that. 75% of antimicrobial prescriptions for people are for throat, sinus, lung, and upper respiratory infections. Most of those are viral, okay? I'm saying, 75% of antimicrobial prescriptions, let me say this again for y'all in the back, 75% of antimicrobial prescriptions are for throat, sinus, lung, and upper respiratory infections that are typically viral. And I mean typically. So we are over prescribing antibiotics. That can't be a surprise to anybody in this room, right? How many times do you go with like urgent care or something like that? And they're just like, here's your antibiotic. And you're like, are we get what? You can test that or like, <laughs> this is just what we do now. That is very common what you see in ERs and in urgent cares, right? They're just trying to get rid of you basically. So um, there's probably, you have a virus but they don't want you to come back either. So here's your, you know, parting gift of your antibiotic. We don't really question it, unfortunately. Now that you guys are going into healthcare, question it, okay? Shotgun approach to antimicrobial therapy, just throwing antibiotics at something because it might work. Um, and a lot of the time, antibiotics from the U.S. are going to be exported where they're not being used properly. And we see more resistance developing in other countries. And then it gets just brought back by those folks there um, and brings the resistance back here. Okay, so there's a lot of our roles in that. Hospitals, of course, play a role. Not necessarily the healthcare workers, of course, a little bit. If we're lax in our universal precautions, as it says, washing our hands and stuff like that, we're more likely to spread um, a resistant pathogen to somebody else or spread a pathogen to somebody who is weakened and is going to be not able to handle um, certain antibiotics. And so those microbes might survive and then carry a resistance that can be spread onto other people. This is all just associated with you know, being in a healthcare setting as a patient or even a practitioner, spreading it around. Um, penicillin now um, is, is one of the drugs that staff, staff always that we typically think of as staff, uh, Staph is completely resistant to it almost entirely. Any strain that you pick up anywhere in the whole world ever, now almost every single one of them is resistant to penicillin. That's happened in the last 30 years. That shouldn't happen naturally, right? That's something that we've done uh, with the advancement of healthcare. Next, we have the most horrendous of all of them, all right? Uh, this is another one I might repeat for those in the back, all right? 80% of all antibiotics in the United States, 80% of all antibiotics in the United States 
are given to livestock. Now, maybe you don't think, okay, well, whatever, they need antibiotics too. No, uh, 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 uh. healthy livestock. They are not sick. Okay. 80% of the antibiotics in the United States are given to livestock in general, non ill livestock. So we are exposing their natural biome to these antibiotics regularly, often in large, large numbers in the United States. Um, the you know, livestock industry insists that improves their health and the size of the animals. That's all they care about really, output of um, the meat, output of the milk, output of whatever product they're trying to get from these organisms, these animals. Um, so anyways, they become resistant to a lot of these antibiotics. And so when those don't work, they'll reach for new ones and so on and so forth. Um, and then the pathogens, the bacteria that are associated with their normal biome or with them getting sick can be then spread to people sometimes. And then, then we have spread of you know, more resistance. That's a serious issue that's unnecessary. Cool, we said it, we know it, it's bad. Uh, the CDC looks at a lot of the, the concerns about drug resistance in pathogens and categorizes them as most concerning to least concerning or whatever. The urgent threats are the worst of the worst. Then we have the serious threats and then the concerning threats, okay? So let's look at how this goes. Some of the urgent threats include carbapenem resistant acinetobacter, which I don't know really much about these guys, but if they're carbapenem resistant, that's a problem. We've already said that's our last line of defense drug. Then we have some they just call drug resistant. This means all available drugs it is resistant to, okay? So Neisseria gonorrhea is one of these. This is well known that there are strains out there it started in Japan, but now they can be found pretty much anywhere in the world that cannot be treated right now, unless we come out with new drug treatments for these. Okay? Um, other ones uh, also fall into this category like um, C. diff. It's becoming a concern as far as how we can treat it anymore. Um, here we have MRSA. It's on the next category of serious threats and other things that we see kind of typically like Salmonella, Campylobacter, Candida. Typically, um, this is talking about Candida um, albicans. Candida auris is a whole other different kind of a thing that we are seeing related to healthcare industry. Um, yeah, and then drug resistant tuberculosis for which we have primarily Russia to thank, but we all know. Um, so did we have the largest amount of drug resistant tuberculosis strains in Russia by far, like it's like no competition, but you can't again, blame people too much for not taking their uh, tuberculosis medication when you have to take some like three pills that are pretty hard on your body for nine to 12 months. Who's keeping up with that, right? So it's not a surprise. And how do we deal with something like that? That might be part of what our next question is. Um, then we have erythromycin resistant and clindamycin resistant group A and group B respectively streptococcus, so strep in general, um, as that's becoming more resistant. Strep, streptococcus pyogenes is associated um, with like necrotizing fasciitis and stuff like that. So if that becomes resistant to treatment, we're gonna just be resorting to like hacking off limbs basically. So we don't want that to happen. Um, I don't know if you guys know what necrotizing fasciitis is. If you haven't heard of that, that's flesh eating bacteria. So it can go pretty, yes, <laughs> what is it, Paige? Uh, one of our, one of my friends who's a nurse, she had uh, a big garden and I sat on the <laughs> we might have to share something like that. I know, I know um, this, those things can get pretty wild. Necrotizing fasciitis, it spreads extremely quickly and you can be healthy and get it. And it is just as simple as that. You get a, you get a cut and typically try to treat it at home, but it doesn't work. And then it turns into necrotizing fasciitis. You'll have to debride a lot of, that means removing like the dead flesh and stuff. So like cutting off flesh, you'll have to, a lot of times need to get, um, once they finally get it under control, uh, grafts and stuff like that to take care of. It. I mean, it is, it's nasty. So no to that one. Um, so how do we deal with these problems of drug resistance? Find new bacterial cell targets, maybe, um, maybe design drugs that aim for known targets, or we can take it a step further, start developing nanomaterials that can target certain aspects of our pathogens, um, use antisense RNAs. That just means that they're going to match up with the regular mRNA that they use to make protein, and it doesn't work anymore if it is double-stranded like that. Can't work anymore. CRISPR technology, we know that we can use that to cut DNA pretty much anywhere we need to. We can use that in a lot of different ways to target pathogens if we can get it to work, you know, widespread. Um, bacteriophages, 
if you have a like T1 bacteriophage only infects uh, E. coli, that's true for all phages. They only infect the one species of bacteria that they infect. So you can use that to target somebody's infection specifically. They haven't gotten a whole lot of work behind that, but they could do that, you know, target all the E. coli with that phage that infects E. coli. Useful stuff. Um, and then antibiotics that will target gram negative outer membrane proteins, something that we have, you know, in the past never even tried to attack. Uh, you can help all this along by boosting up your own microbiome, your um, ability of your, you know, stadium seats to be full all the time with the good guys. Um, and that would promote, you know, effective microbial antagonism, which, you know, is protecting us that way. So we can replace lost microbes like this. You took antibiotics, you need a new flora, eat some of these. Um, you can also just supplement your existing flora. Maybe you've got mostly bad, quote unquote, bacteria, which apparently this is a thing. You can get tested, like have your poop tested and see like your gut biome and like which, oh, feed the good guys in your gut so you have a better gut, healthy gut. Turns out you can have all bad ones. I'm speaking from experience, okay? So, <laughs> so you might wanna, you know, amp that up a bit with some, with some uh, probiotics, guys. Um, they're pretty safe. They're pretty effective. Just be sure um, that, you know, you take them according to what they're prescribed to be done. So then we have prebiotics. This is just basically food for those guys so that they live like you want them to continue living. The good guys, let's promote those. Um, and if you are somebody who is continually having issues with C. diff, typically, if you're somebody that has had C. diff, you will continue to have C. diff issues when you go to take antibiotics. They can clear out your biome and take a poop sample from somebody that you live close to. They usually want it to be someone you live close to because you're going to share biomes anyways. Um, and then process it effectively. You don't want to treat it. It's not just going to be straight up poop getting put into you. Okay. But they'll treat it. And then you go under anesthesia and get your little colonoscopy and they implant it that way. You don't have to drink poop mixture or anything like that. So fecal transplants are very effective at replacing. Yes. Fecal transplants for dogs? Sure, sure. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Like when you put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that counts, right? So that's technically a fecal transplant. Yeah, that's cool to think about. I did not think about it that way. So um, that is an effective way to get a new biome as well. The, and I'm gonna, we're gonna do the Kahoot, but um, real quick, this just reminding you guys, think about how Kirby Bauer can be used in a clinical setting. It's useful, it's not just, you know, for show. So.